Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll learn about the 75th anniversary of the Lake Detroiters Association. But first, joining me now is Dr. Don Warren, the director of the Indians into Medicine program at the University of North Dakota. Dr. Warren, thanks for joining us Happy today. to be here, thanks. Well, as we start off, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. I'm a family physician. I also have a master's degree in public health. So I've worked in healthcare my entire career. I'm originally from Kyle, South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. So I've kind of lived all over the, the country since that point. Uh, spent a lot of my career in Arizona. Also worked back in South Dakota for a number of years and been here in North Dakota for close to 10 years. Close to 10 years. Well, now, I understand you wear a few hats at the uh, University of North Dakota, so maybe you can tell us what your other titles are. Sure, at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, in addition to being Director of both the Indians into Medicine or InMed program and Director of the Master of Public Health program, as well as Professor of Family and Community Medicine. Okay, well, we're here to, you're here today, I hope, to talk uh, a, a lot about the Indians into Medicine program. So let's start with that, what is Indians into Medicine? program? Well, InMed actually started in 1973, and the focus is to try to address the disparity and the shortage of American Indian physicians. Uh, we make up nearly 2% of the U.S. population, but we're only about 0.2% of the physician population. So we're the most underrepresented of the underrepresented minority groups. So InMed has been focused on trying to increase the numbers of American Indians going into the health sciences, particularly medicine. And the class that just started this fall is the class of 2023. So it's the 50 year anniversary of InMed actually is the class of 2023. And uh, we've now graduated through InMed programs over 240 American Indian physicians. So worldwide, it actually is the most successful indigenous medical training program. Hmm. So coming up on the 50th anniversary, that would be interesting, but let's go back to you. How has the job been going and when were you hired and How's it been going since then? Uh, things are going very well. Been there about a year and a half, so started in May of 2018. And when I was first hired, it was uh, in those roles as associate dean as well as director of InMed. Uh, since that time, I've also became director of the Master Public Health Program, which has been wonderful. We've developed now an indigenous health specialization in the master's degree program. And next fall, we will be starting the first PhD in indigenous health. And we're linking all of those opportunities to InMed as well. Okay. How many students are enrolled right now in the program? Well, we take six to seven per year. And the way it works, uh, we want to have cohorts of American Indian and Alaska Native medical students. Uh, what we've seen is that schools that might admit one person at a time or one person every other class, quite often people feel socially isolated. Uh, they don't feel culturally connected while they're in school. And those are some of the challenges that we face for trying to increase the numbers of American Indian physicians. So we have a cohort model where, again, it's six to seven students per year that are admitted into InMed. Yeah. Can, can you tell us more, obviously, a 50-year history? Uh, tell us a little bit about the history and, and maybe why it was founded and how it was founded. Yeah, so it was founded by stakeholders actually here in North Dakota. Uh, many of our uh, leaders in education, including Dr. David Gipp, uh, he was the uh, president of the United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck for a number of years. Of course, he has since retired. He actually had served uh, as the original board member for InMed. Uh, we also have Twyla Martin Kakaba from Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. She's one of our original board members, and they are both still on the board uh, as original charter members from 46 years ago, which is really remarkable. So we have a long history and deep rooted connections to the tribal nations here in North Dakota. The original focus for InMed also includes the states of Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Nebraska, recognizing that here in the Northern Plains, we have terrible health disparities, but also significant shortages of healthcare providers. So the original goal was to work with University of North Dakota and uh, related programming in the region to try to address the shortage of providers. Yeah, and, and obviously over that 50 year history and, and from your experience and, and your knowledge, how, is, how have things really changed from 73 to, to now? Well, through InMed, I think we've had a, a great deal of success. Again, InMed programming has now graduated over 240 physicians in that time frame. The challenge is, in that time frame, we probably needed 5,000 physicians, to be perfectly honest. We still have a terrible shortage. But any one medical school certainly can't solve the entire problem nationwide. So what we are doing is partnering with other medical schools around the nation, sharing 
ideas and resources and programming and working collaboratively to try to increase the numbers of American Indians going into healthcare all over the world and all over the country. And uh, of course, no single medical student or uh, medical school can solve all the problems, but we're, we're really doing our part at University of North Dakota. We have the highest percentage of indigenous medical students of any program in the world. So mm -hmm. I really feel like we've taken steps in the right direction, but we need more schools to focus on this type of development. So who's eligible to uh, enroll in the InMed program? So for InMed, it's not based on race per se. It's actually you have to be an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe. So an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe is actually a political designation. So when you have uh, American Indian and Alaska Native people as a racial group, not everyone is an enrolled member of a tribe. And certainly uh, for enrolled tribal members, they are typically speaking more culturally connected because it's important for us that the graduates actually go to serve the underserved populations. So we're not trying to just increase the numbers of physicians overall, just as a, a number to increase. We really want our graduates to work in the communities that need their services the most. Mm -hmm. Well, can you talk some about the relationship with the reservations and then, and then sort of placing doctors from UND into these areas? Yeah, so after you finish medical school, of course, that's when you start residency. And what we see typically is that people tend to work close to where they completed their residency program. So we do have a strong connectivity to the uh, family practice residencies throughout the state of North Dakota as well. And then we work very closely with our tribal partners. And each of the tribes has a representative on our tribal advisory board for InMed. And we have some tremendous success stories. For example, at Fort Yates Hospital in Standing Rock, five of the physicians are InMed alums. We actually have an InMed alum who is now uh, the president for Sanford Health in Bismarck, uh, Dr. LeBeau. He's actually an InMed alumnus as well. We also have an InMed alumnus who's on tribal council at the Mandan Hidatsa and Arikara Nation, Dr. Uh, Monica Mayer. So we've seen our alumni go into primary care physicians, specialty care positions, and they serve our people in a number of capacities, including moving up the leadership ladders, both from a tribal politics perspective as well as a healthcare governance perspective. Mm -hmm. So how do you recruit young people to enroll in the InMed program? What's wonderful about InMed is we look at the pathway starting very early in the process. We don't just look for medical school applicants. We have what's called our Summer Institute, and that's where we bring in 40 to 50 middle school and high school students to UND for six weeks during the summer. And these are students typically from reservation communities all over the country, of course, mainly in the Dakotas, but we have students from Wyoming, Montana, Minnesota, Nebraska, Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and they come to UND for six weeks in the summer and live in the dorms, kind of learn what it's like to live on a college campus. And then over the six week period, they take courses in biology, chemistry, physics, math, and communication. So we keep them very busy during the day, um, but they tend to enjoy it a great deal. We have fun events on weekends and, and nighttime, and more than half of the cohort every year applies to come back the following year. So I think that shows that there's real enjoyment and satisfaction with that program. And what we see from those uh, participants in Summer Institute is higher uh, college application and, and graduation from college. And we have had many of our InMed medical school alums actually start with InMed through the Summer Institute in middle school and high school. Hmm. Interesting. But well, can you talk some about the health care and health care needs uh, on the reservation? We unfortunately have among the worst health status in the nation when we look at the tribal populations, particularly in the Dakotas. And if you look at the, for example, average age at death for American Indians uh, in North Dakota and South Dakota, it's about 20 to 21 years lower than the non-Indian population. So for example, here in North Dakota, average age at death is about 76 years. And for the American Indian population, it's about 54 or 55 years. So terrible health disparities. So in many ways, we have third world health conditions right here in the heartland of, of the United States. And I remind my colleagues who work in public health academics that you do not have to cross an ocean to find third world health conditions. It's right here in our reservation communities, even many of our inner cities, we see terrible health disparities. And some of the, the causes of health disparities uh, include uh, early age of death due to infant mortality. We have higher rates of death and disability due to unintentional injuries. 
We also tend to see chronic disease diagnosed earlier. So uh, diabetes is a big problem. And as a result of that, we see earlier age at onset of disease, earlier age of complications of things like diabetes, like you know kidney failure and heart disease, and then earlier age at death. So we have terrible health disparities. And one of the approaches that we need to explore is increasing the healthcare workforce to address these disparities, both on the public health side and prevention and on the medical side, focusing on treating disease. Okay. Well, h how did your background, I guess, uh, you know, <clears throat> growing up in Pine Ridge, as you mentioned, shape you into becoming a doctor? Well, I was very fortunate. I grew up in a family with a lot of traditional healers and medicine men. So uh, in my own experience, I was deeply immersed in health services from a traditional cultural perspective. In addition to that, my mom is a nurse. She's 80 years old. I like to say she failed retirement. She's still working. Uh, she tried retirement and it didn't take, uh, but she's now working actually with South Dakota State University running the American Indian Nursing Program out of SDSU. And in my own experience, just being deeply immersed in health systems, whether it's from a traditional cultural perspective or more of a modern scientific perspective, I just kind of knew that that's what I wanted to, to do. And when I was a young man, I was given my grandfather's Lakota name, which is Prejuta Wichasha, which means medicine man, actually in Lakota language. So I'm not a medicine man, but that is my Lakota name. I was named after my grandfather, who was a traditional healer. So in my own experience, I've just been deeply immersed in the field of healthcare and health services, and also very much committed to improving the health of our people and the lives for people living on reservations. Sure. Well, you know, we talk, you talk about healthcare, you know, it has so many different people employed in various um, ways. So other than being a doctor, uh, what kinds of careers can students go into? Well, we have a tremendous shortage of essentially all of the healthcare disciplines. So in medicine, of course, that's the, the discipline that takes the most years for medical school and residency and training to actually work in the field. But we have a shortage of even nursing assistants. So, so certified nursing assistants and RNs, also the therapists. We have a shortage of occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy. And as we know, we have a tremendous need for long-term care services, nursing homes. You cannot have long-term care services unless you have occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. And we have tremendous shortages of those specialists in uh, American Indian health programs. Uh, in addition, we need behavioral health workers, whether it's psychiatry or psychology, and certainly substance abuse, counseling, social workers, essentially the whole gamut, the whole spectrum of health services. We have shortages uh, working in our communities. And we can't just expect that the outside world will come and solve this for us. We really need to grow our own and really encourage our young people to pursue healthcare careers. Yeah, well, how many degrees does uh, your program offer? So at School of Medicine and Health Sciences, of course, we have the MD program. We also have physician assistant, occupational therapy, physical therapy, master of public health, athletic training, biomedical sciences, and next fall, we will be starting the first PhD in indigenous health. And we have a tremendous amount of interest worldwide in that degree program. We already have about 30 students interested in applying to our, our doctorate program focused on indigenous health, more from a public health and research perspective. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of research is going on in your arena? Well, one of the areas that we've been focusing on is looking at the impact of unresolved trauma on uh, poor health outcomes. And when we think about uh, the causes of our disparities, one of the upstream causes is unresolved trauma, whether it's historical trauma and intergenerational trauma, uh, all these cataclysmic and terrible events that occurred to peoples in Western Minnesota and in the Dakotas historically does have an intergenerational impact. We also know that adverse childhood experiences lead to higher rates of chronic disease and behavioral health conditions, as well as risk factors for disease. So much of our work recently has been focused on trying to improve our understanding of historical trauma, unresolved trauma, but also resiliency factors. We still have a great number of people who are doing well and thriving. And what is it about th those sectors of our populations that allows people to thrive even in very adverse conditions. So we're trying to understand the uproot, uh, the upstream causes that really are at the root of some of our health challenges. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some of the success stories, I think, already, but can you tell us more about uh, some of the, your students who have graduated and now maybe serving underserved areas? 
Yeah, it's really wonderful because everywhere I go throughout uh, Indian country, we find InMed alums. So uh, whether they're uh, alumni from the medical program or even from the Summer Institute, uh, we have Summer Institute alumni who work in Washington, D.C. and uh, high-level positions in Department of Health and Human Services. So when I go to Washington, D.C. and talk about InMed and when I talk about University of North Dakota, we have people in high-level positions who know what I'm talking about because they've gone through our programs. Now, InMed itself, is, is, it, is that just the four years and then you go on if you're going to go into whatever career? How, how, what is InMed yeah, itself? So, so InMed, again, starts all the way down uh, to middle school. So we have the InMed Summer Institute. Okay, yeah. We also have a MCAT prep. The MCAT is a medical college admissions test. So that's for seniors in college or people who recently graduated who are preparing to take the medical college admissions test. So we have a preparation program that's seven weeks in the summer where they, they go through um, uh, tutoring and studying and preparing for the MCAT. This is some of our success stories there. We take 10 students per year in that program and each year all 10 students improve their scores from pre to post. And several of our first year students are alums from our MCAT prep program. So we see the, the pathway program working effectively. Right. Yeah, that's good. Uh, how about faculty and staff? How many do you have? Well, what I'm really pleased about, we actually now have five indigenous health scholars. And it's American Indian, Alaska Native, even First Nations from Canada. One of our recent hires is a naturopathic physician from Canada. She also has a Master of Public Health from Dartmouth. And we have very highly educated, well-trained indigenous health scholars with very good experience working in this field. And that's just on the indigenous health side. We now have about a dozen uh, public health and in-med faculty and probably six or seven uh, staff members really focused on the entire arena of improving the disparities in uh, health professionals. Yeah, can you tell us about the, maybe some of the students you currently have? Sure, we have students who are right from here in North Dakota, including from the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation, from Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. One of our students who just started her residency, she just graduated from InMed, is planning to go back to her home community and open up her own clinic. Actually, she wants to offer health services even outside the typical Indian health service arena. And I see a lot of innovative, creative, intelligent young people pursuing this. And I feel very encouraged about the future just based on, on the InMed students that we currently have and thinking about the, the future students that will be applying to our program who I've met through the Summer Institute. And it's just wonderful to see these young people pursuing health careers and really wanting to improve the lives of their people. Mm -hmm. So where do you see the program going uh, long term now? Well, I'm hoping that long term we continue on this path. We have been trying to pursue more scholarship opportunities for our students, so we're in the process of developing endowed scholarships. I would like to see more students coming to UND really for it to be the destination medical school for American Indian students, but also to decrease the student loan burden and debt uh, challenges. So that's a, an area that we're looking to grow. In addition to that, we want to help other universities and medical schools that are trying to help address the shortage of American Indian providers. And we're more than happy to, to share our processes and improve the outcomes. Hmm. So if people want more information, where can they go? Actually, the easiest thing is just to Google InMed UND or University of North Dakota Indians into Medicine program. All right. Well, Dr. Warren, thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate that. Stay tuned for more. A longstanding Minnesota Lakes organization is celebrating its 75th anniversary in 2019. It's the Lake Detroiters Association, which monitors and supports Detroit Lake, located in the heart of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. The organization aims to maintain the lake and ensure fun and frolic for all who visit. I like everything about living on the lake. The swimming, the fishing, the boating, the view. It's just a fun, fun place to live. I wouldn't live anyplace else. It's our Lake Detroiters Association 75th anniversary. We're going to celebrate the impact that Lake Detroit has had on the not only the county, but the region. 
Our family has been on Lake Detroit since the 50s. My grandfather and my grandmother came over here from Fargo and settled on the west side of Little Detroit. And I say that's the nicest spot on the lake. And we've been there ever since. Our theme this year for our 75th anniversary is love, honor, and own the lake. And that's what all our members try to do. We've worked extremely hard in trying to eradicate weeds, and we've worked with the legislature. Lake Detroiters grew out of a predecessor organization called the Lake Detroit Property Owners Association that was formed in 1944. That organization did not survive very well, owing to a death of some of the leadership. And the organization was converted to the Lake Detroiters Association in 1949. We have approximately 390 members as of a few months ago. They had a big start. They ended up with 140 members in the first year, and they did quite a heroic thing right at the beginning. They were focused a little more, not so much on the erosion issue, but rather on the weed problems and algae problems that were beginning to confront the lakes around here. The museum plays a really important role in local anniversaries because we've been gifted many pictures over the years. We have lots of documents and advertisements and really it's all subject to the items that we've been able to collect or items that have come in from individuals, whether they're residents or past residents. And moving forward, I think that museums are recognizing they need to do a little more due diligence on capturing history as it's happening. When we look back and we're looking at those older records, We've really done the call out for various anniversaries and the most recent one being the Lake Detroiters anniversary. We have lots of lake photos. Little plug though, if you're taking photos and you want to think about donating those someday, make sure you document who's in them and what year it is. We're the single biggest impact to the state legislature from a lobbying standpoint. So realize that every lake owner throughout Minnesota may pay 10, 20, to be a member of our Lake Association. Our dues are $25, pretty modest. But we do a myriad of things with those dollars, working with AIS, working with the weed control, and any impact that the lake may have to its residents. The public beach was completed in 1965. There were two forces involved. One was the need to kind of clean up the beach. The other thing is that the city was dumping its stormwater into the lake. All the streets come downhill to the lake and the water just came down the hill and went into the lake. It's not only an attractive amenity for the community, but it also serves an important water quality function. And Lake Detroiters was very much in support of that. When our forefathers put that beach in and had the foresight to take that land and put that city beach in, I mean, that was a game changer. That was just huge. City water and sewer was a game changer when they did that throughout the lakes area back in the 70s. Other lake associations are studying that, but the cost is so insurmountable now. I'm glad we did that in the 70s. We've moved largely into an educational and informational role, partly because the state and the Pelican River Watershed District has imposed a lot of restrictions on lakefront development and the use of lakes. There's not a lot that lake associations can do that directly addresses the problems. So what lake associations can do is to improve the climate of understanding of what's happening. One of the ways we increase our membership is by sending out beach captains. Every beach has a captain, and a beach consists of maybe 10, 20 homeowners. And we get beach captains together at a meeting. We give them the information to give to the homeowners and we include the homeowner's recommendations and comments about what they care about, and that comes back to the Lake Detroiters. And then we try and deal with the issues that the homeowners are really worried about. I lived a lot of places around the world and around the states, but I never missed a summer. So when we contemplated retiring, it was not a hard choice for us to choose to come to Detroit Lakes. The lake is the backbone of the city, and the city is very helpful to us in projects that we want to do. The lakes in our area and Detroit Lake in particular have really played a key role in the development of Detroit Lakes as a city. You sit down and you start talking about whether it's an industry such as ice harvest and how it played a really key part of the development early in the early years to the community 
or you talk about the Fargo-Moorhead area residents or the Minneapolis-St. Paul residents that vacation here and use it purely more recreational, all the way to those that have enjoyed living on the lake for a good portion of their life. And it's really the way they relax and come home and can't imagine life any other way. Everybody is welcome. We feel we're stewards of the lake, but so are all the other visitors to the lake. We welcome them and hope they have a good time. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Post this week. And as always, thanks for watching. by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.